Get started. Father, we're grateful, as the book of Ephesians says, for the height and the width and the depth for the love of God for the saints. And I just pray, Lord, that we would leave here today maybe not so much um, with an understanding of what we should do, we invite that, but an understanding of who we are in the beloved, knowing that right behavior will flow out of a right understanding of our identity. So we're so appreciative, Lord, for what you've done for us. We're appreciative of our eternal position, security in you. We do understand, Lord, that our actions as fallen people, even as your children, can inhibit not our position but fellowship. And so we're just going to pause for a few moments of silence to confess any personal sins that we have committed against you so that fellowship can be restored so that we can receive freely today from your word. Lord, we're grateful for the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which the promise given there that broken fellowship can be restored. We're grateful for a completed canon of your word, where we have a, a, in the Bible everything we need for all matters of faith and godliness. And we're also grateful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, whereby that canon of Scripture can be properly interpreted and understood by your people. So we do invite, Lord, today uh, the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, that we may leave here with better understanding, better equipped for the different battles that we find ourselves in. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy uh, last Sunday in July. And let's take our Bibles, if we could, today and open them to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39, and verse 22. Um, We find ourselves really at the tail end of our study on the Middle East meltdown. Uh, the Gog Magog War, and basically that's a verse by verse study that we started at the beginning of the new year, beginning in chapter 36, finishing in chapter 39. And you know, as a teacher, it's always tempting to just sort of move on to the next topic. Um, but this time around, we gave people an opportunity to submit questions. Because now's the time to answer those questions while, we're, while the subject matter is fresh in our minds. And so here are four questions uh, that we're going to look at this morning um, that came in. The first three, I think, will go by pretty fast. But I'll have to do some explaining on question number four. So the first question relates to the battle of Gog Magog as described in Ezekiel, and says, Do you believe the Gog-Magog War is the great battle at the end of the tribulation period? In other words, is this talking about Armageddon? And I think we've sort of answered that, um, but the short answer to it is no. Uh, Here's a chart that I like to use showing the differences between Armageddon and Ezekiel 38 and 39. You probably have seen this before if you've following, been following our teaching. I got this from um, Dr. Pentecost's book, Things to Come. I just took what he said there in a, and put it into outline or chart form. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's no battle, but at Armageddon, there is a battle between the armies and the Lord. And he's got all the scripture verses there to show you what we're talking about. 
In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the uh, invaders come from the west and the north, but at Armageddon, all nations invade. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the enemies are destroyed on Israel's mountains, but in the Battle of Armageddon, the events take place in the city of Jerusalem and in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, Israel is dwelling in safety before the battle occurs, but she's not dwelling in safety before Armageddon occurs. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is no description of a massive blood flow, but that is described with Armageddon, where the blood will flow from the horses, uh, up to the horses' bridles for 200 miles. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the fire comes upon the invaders. In Armageddon, the fire does not come on the invaders. So to sort of make a long story short, the view that we that I have taken on Ezekiel 38 and 39 as I've tried to teach this is Ezekiel 38 is happening towards the beginning of the tribulation period and it starts with the opening of the second seal judgment. And then when you get to chapter 39, it sort of flash forwards to the very end of everything. All of the tribulation events, including Armageddon, and shows you the end result, which will be a converted Israel and the birds of prey gorging on the deceased corpses of the invaders. Um, so, you know, to understand Armageddon and how that fits in, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is really not the place to do that. You have to consult other scripture. Like Joel 3... Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, and Revelation 16. Second question is, and this is very important because there's a lot of confusion on this. It says, if there are no prophecies to be fulfilled before the rapture, that's what we call the doctrine of eminency. In other words, the rapture can take place at any moment. The rapture could take place before this Sunday school lesson is over. And some of you are probably praying for that to happen. If there are no prophecies to be fulfilled before the rapture, and this is kind of a compound question, A, when did this eminency doctrine start in the Bible? B, where does it say this in God's word? C, what about Israel's return to the promised land? Is Israel's return to the promised land that we're seeing fulfilled in our lifetime, is this some sort of sign that had to happen before the rapture could occur? Is there any prophetic fulfillment? Many pastors and teachers present Ezekiel 36 through 39 as having a present fulfillment. So... There is a lot of misunderstanding about this, even in dis so-called dispensational circles. I noticed that even some of the younger scholars at Dallas Seminary, when I was a student there, even they didn't have this particularly correct. And basically what they were, they were saying is they were trying to argue that dispensationalists, that would be us, have always taught that Israel had to come back into the land before the rapture could occur. And so let's sort of clear this up if we could. Notice, uh, if you will, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, which we believe is the first reference to the rapture of the whole church described anywhere in the Bible. It's what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room as he was preparing them for the church age. He said in verses 1 through 4, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If that were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's the rapture. 
I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way in which I am going. Now, before you get to that statement in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, every reference to the return of Christ anywhere in the Bible prior to Jesus saying this is the, is the Lord Jesus is going to return at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. His angels and his saints will be with him. His feet will actually touch down on planet Earth. And he will rule the world for a thousand years with a rod of iron. So that concept of the return of Christ is found in countless passages in the Old Testament. In fact, the very oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, makes reference to this. In Job chapter 19, verse 25, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives... The Hebrew, therefore, redeemer is goel. I know that my goel lives. And in the end, he, my redeemer, in other words, will take his stand on the earth. So beginning with that passage and every passage you can find in the Old Testament, and even in most of the Gospels, for that matter, it describes the second advent. But you see, what's happening in the upper room is you have a scenario where the nation of Israel has rejected the offer of the kingdom. The kingdom's not going to come. There's going to be an age of kingdom postponement. And he starts to outline here what God is going to do during this interim age. And part of it revolves around the body that we are now connected to called the church and that church age has been going on for 2,000 years it's not the kingdom it's the church age and so the church age would need new doctrine because no doctrine prior to this point in time encompasses the church so Jesus in the upper room with 11 disciples only Judas the only unbeliever having left the room in the prior chapter John chapter 13, begins to outline in seed form doctrines that are later going to be amplified in the epistles, the letters, concerning church age doctrine. And so what you'll find in this section of scripture, it's called the Upper Room Discourse. It's called the Upper Room Discourse because he gave this conversation in the Upper Room. See how easy theology is? And in the Upper Room Discourse, he's outlining the church age. And he's giving brand new truth that they've never heard before. And one of the things he starts to talk about in this conversation is how the church age is going to end. And he teaches them something completely and totally new here. He's not talking about the second advent, which will happen at the end of the tribulation period, when he touches down on planet Earth, He's talking here about a coming in the air for his saints. And as they're caught up to join him in the air, they make an about face. And they don't come to the earth to rule and reign. But they go to the Father's house, to places that he has prepared for us for seven years. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to be given the privilege of taking that seed truth and, you know, it's like, um, it's like doing art. What Jesus said there in John 14, 1 through 4, is like the black and white picture. Paul's going to come along under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, and he's going to take out his colors and he's going to color the black and white picture Not changing the black and white picture, but just adding greater detail. So this right here, what he's saying, is the beginning of the the truth of the rapture. It's describing how the church age is going to end with a return of Jesus to take us out of this world. It's a truth that was completely and totally foreign to them. They had never heard anything like this before. Because all they knew is Jesus returning at the end of the seven years to launch his thousand-year kingdom. This is something different. 
So in the process of unfolding this truth, he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, in the series we did prior to this one, on the doctrine of the rapture, we have about three specific, if memory serves, lessons just on these four verses, because they're that important. So if you really want to dial down onto this, we recommend those three lessons in our rapture series. But you notice what Jesus says. He says, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. He doesn't give any sign that has to happen first before he comes again to receive us to himself. He doesn't say, okay, um, keep your eye on the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab because they're going to be pushing one world government and then I'm going to come back and get you. Uh, keep your eye on your cash because your cash is going to disappear and you're going to move into a cashless society and then I'm going to come back and receive you. Uh, keep your eye on Russia and Persia and Turkey because they're going to invade the land of Israel in the last days. And then I'm going to come and receive you. He gives absolutely no sign at all. And when he gave no sign prior to this event, he was telling them that this could happen at any second. And this is a doctrine that we call the eminency of the rapture. And it began to take hold the moment in Acts chapter 1, he ascended back to the Father's right hand. The moment that happened, and the church was born in Acts 2, at any second, the rapture could occur. Now, he did make some other types of predictions, like he said, you know, Peter, when you were young, you know, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. When you're old, they're going to take you to where you do not want to go. In John 21, referring to the martyrdom of Peter, how Peter would die. But when Jesus made those kinds of things, he wasn't denying the eminency of the rapture. What he was saying was, if I don't come and get you, Peter, this is what's going to happen to you. So if A doesn't happen, B will happen. And that's how to put the rapture together with some of Christ's short-term predictions. So the doctrine of the eminency of the rapture is a concept that started at the beginning of the church age and it took foothold immediately when Jesus ascended and went back to the Father's right hand and gave to the church the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, including the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So in our rapture teaching, you know, we've gone through all of the different passages that teach this. I have them underlined there. We won't look at all of them, but here are very clear eminency uh, verses. They never present the coming of the Lord in the rapture as contingent upon some event that has to happen first. You'll see it in James chapter 5, verse 8. You'll see the doctrine in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. You'll see the doctrine in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. You'll see the doctrine in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. You know, I've used this analogy before. It's kind of a corny one, but it, you know, helps us understand it. It's like those um, plastic balls that kids play with that are wrapped in that uh, black stuff. What's that black stuff around it called where it allows you to stick to walls? Velcro, there we go. Um, so you have this little plastic ball, and it's wrapped in Velcro. And you just kind of throw it up on the ceiling, and it sticks there. Now, what's interesting about that is you don't know exactly when that's gonna, that ball is going to come back down. I mean, maybe it's going to be there for five minutes. Maybe it's going to be there for 30 seconds. Maybe it's going to be there for a month, a week, a year. But at any moment that ball will come down. And that's how the Lord has wanted the rapture to be understood by every Christian generation going back 2,000 years. 
And the reason he wants us to understand this is the truth of the matter is we live differently, don't we? When we think he can come at any moment. It's like your boss, you're at work, and your boss says, I'm leaving for two months. Um, we know how that will probably end. You kind of slack off for two months and then get back things back together when the two-month period's over or getting close. What if your boss says, I'm leaving, and I could stick my head in the office to see how you're doing at any moment? Your work habit is completely different. And, <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, the Lord gave us the doctrine of the eminency of the rapture because he knew the stimulus that it would provide for holy living. Everywhere the doctrine of the rapture is taught, and for years and years and years, I'm a member of the pre-trib study group, I heard Tim LaHaye say this, he said it every single year while he was alive. Um, I've been going to that group since 9-11. Um, and he would get up and he would say, everywhere the doctrine of the rapture and it's the imminent, any moment appearance of Christ is taught, there's always a greater level of Christian urgency, Christian evangelism, Christian holy living. And he says, just keep that in mind as all of these scholars get up here and read their papers. This is not just, you know, pie in the sky stuff we're trying to defend. This has a real world implication for God's church. And I believe very much that this is why Satan is trying to destroy this doctrine. He's tried to destroy it for 2,000 years. And all you have to do is spend a little time online. And you see entire so-called ministries devoted to debunking, as they call it, the any moment appearance of Jesus for his church. That, by the way, is why we believe the rapture has to take place before the tribulation starts. Because if you put the rapture in the middle of the tribulation, end of the tribulation, three quarters into the tribulation, and you ask such people arguing that way, can Jesus come back today? They always say no. Now, the late uh, Dr. John Walvoord, one of the greatest um, defenders of the doctrine that we're describing here, the rapture of the church, in his office at Dallas Seminary, had a plaque on his wall, and it said, perhaps today. And only a person that's pre-tribulational can believe that. You ask uh, someone that thinks the rapture is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation period, the plaque would have to read, perhaps in 42 months or more. Or perhaps in seven years or more. Or perhaps in three quarters of the tribulation or more. Pre-tribulationalism is the only doctrine in the landscape of competing views which teaches that Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. Which means we need to be ready all of the time, because he can come back at any time. Amen? Paul himself, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, obviously believed this. Because he says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now, what word of the Lord would that be? Would that be some kind of private vision that he received from God? Could be. But I think the word of the Lord is John 14, 1 through 4. So Paul is not creating a brand new doctrine here. He's saying, I'm going to tell you something that Jesus already communicated to his disciples in the upper room. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, he put himself in the category, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And this is where he goes on and he talks about the harpazo that we will be caught up. And when he says we, he's saying this could happen in my lifetime. This could happen to me. And when he said we, he didn't say, okay, here's five signs that have to happen first before the rapture. Jesus never taught it that way, nor did Paul. 
Paul also in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, another rapture passage, says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. So this is a, a very significant doctrine, and it's taught in the Bible, as the question asks me. It's taught in John 14, 1 through 3, 1 through 4. It's taught by the Apostle Paul in those, what I would call the we we sections. So there is absolutely nothing that has to take place before the rapture can occur. The confusion is, well, you guys, you talk so much about Israel's spiritual, uh, physical birth, political birth in 1948. You keep calling that a sign of the times. Are you saying that the rapture could not have occurred before Israel became a nation? Well, the thing to understand is Israel's physical birth is stage setting, not for the rapture, but it is stage setting for what will take place after the rapture, the seven-year tribulation period. Because Jesus, although he can come back at any moment in the rapture, the doctrine of eminency does not apply to the second advent of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. The rapture is an eminent event, any moment, but not so the second advent. In fact, the second advent can't even occur until the whole seven-year tribulation period elapses. Then he'll come back, touch down on planet Earth, and rule and reign with a rod of iron for a thousand years. But that can't happen until the seven-year tribulation precedes it. Not so the rapture. So what is God doing as we speak? We believe that he is setting the stage, not for the rapture, but for the tribulation period. So we've used this example before. It's, it's like a chess game. The world system that we're living in is about to experience the ultimate chess match. And you can't have a chess match until somebody sets up the game board. And somebody has to take the board out of the box, put it on the table, assemble the pieces. The players have to take their respective positions opposite side of the table. Even before that happens, someone has to put two chairs on the opposite side of the table. And only when the stage is set can you say to yourself, is a chess match ready to begin? So what we would understand as the rebirth of Israel is not a sign for the rapture, but it is a sign that has to be in place for the seven-year tribulation period to start. Now this idea of God setting the stage for prophetic events like he is today through the tribulation period should not be shocking to you at all. Because this is exactly what God did for the first coming of Christ. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 of the first coming of Christ says, But when the fullness of time came... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. You'll notice there that Jesus Christ, in his first coming, could not have been dropped into human history at any old time. He had to be dropped into human history at a specific time. And there are many things that God was doing in the world to set the stage for the first coming of Christ before Jesus was ever born into our world. One of the things he did through Alexander the Great, going back to the 300s roughly BC, is Alexander the Great spread the Greek language all over the known world. And if you know anything about the Greek language, you know that it's one of the fullest dialects that's ever come to humanity. There is one word for love in English. The Greeks had four words. There's a, a, a storgus, relational love, uh, leo, brotherly love, eros, uh, romantic love, and then there's agape, selfless, 
sacrificial love. And so when it says in John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc., it uses the word agape. And a Greek speaker could pick up on that and say, wow, God really loves us at the highest level. That type of communication would not exist without the Greek language. So God, through Alexander the Great, allowed the right language to be put into place before Jesus ever showed up to record the revelation of God's Son. Beyond that, the Romans had come to power. They came into the land of Israel about 63 B.C. under, um, see, I think it was Pompeii, and they brought into existence over the known world Pax Romana, Roman peace, relative peace, and they introduced something called Roman roads. You've heard the description, all roads lead to Rome. That's why the book of Acts concludes with the gospel making it to Rome in Acts 28. Why does the book of Acts conclude in Acts 28 with the gospel making it to Rome? Because the assumption is once it makes it to Rome, it's going to go everywhere because of Roman roads. So you have Pax Romana, you have Roman roads, and you have the circumstances completely in place as put there by God himself as he allowed the Roman Empire to come to power. So when the gospel reaches its fruition through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, the gospel can go everywhere because God loves everybody and wants everybody to have an opportunity to believe it. So this is the, un this is the meaning of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. So what I'm trying to explain is the world was set up by God before the second advent happened. And what you are seeing happen now in human history concerning the rebirth of the nation of Israel and a plethora of other signs is God, in a similar way, is setting the stage for the second advent of Jesus Christ. You can't have... Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, take place without Israel in existence. Because what starts the tribulation period, according to Daniel 9, verse 27, is a treaty of some kind between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel. That's what starts the final seven years on Daniel's clock, which will lead to the second advent. Obviously, that's a hard scripture to fulfill if there's, no tr if there's no Israel in place in unbelief for the Antichrist to make a treaty with. So that's how you understand the rebirth of the nation of Israel. You say, wow, um, God is really setting the stage for the seven-year tribulation period. Those are not signs for the rapture, which for the last 2,000 years could have occurred at any moment. The moment someone tells you Israel had to be reborn for the rapture to occur is the moment you're dealing with somebody that has confused categories. They're not rightfully dividing God's word. So with all of that being said, hmm, how would you look at, as a New Testament Christian, the rebirth of Israel? You say to yourself, my goodness, the Lord is really aggressively, as we speak, setting the stage for the seven-year tribulation period. And, aha, I know something else. That the rapture of the church, because it's an imminent event, will take place before the tribulation period even starts. So if the world stage is being set this aggressively for the seven-year tribulation period, the rapture, which is imminent and could happen at any moment, must be drawing even closer. It's coming even faster because it comes before the seven-year tribulation period. And if that's true, I better start living my life as if I'm on borrowed time. 
So this is an example I've used before. It's not original with me. Dr. The late Dr. John Walvoord used this example or illustration. I've heard um, Pastor Chuck Smith use this illustration. It's the illustration of Christmas and Thanksgiving. You've heard this before, no doubt. Literally, the day after Halloween. And if you don't believe me, just go to First Colony Mall and you'll see it. The day after Halloween, sometimes earlier, they start putting up all their Christmas stuff. I mean, Santa Claus is put up, Christmas tree lights come out. It's during that season that, you know, you hear Christmas music on the radio. And you're saying to yourself, well, I'm seeing all of these signs for Christmas. Christmas must be coming quick. But wait a minute. Thanksgiving occurs earlier on the calendar than Christmas. And if Christmas is coming that fast... Thanksgiving is coming even faster. So Santa Claus actually is a sign for Thanksgiving. And that's how I would look at the rebirth of the nation of Israel. You don't look at it and say, okay, that had to happen, and the Jews have to rebuild their temple, and we have to have a one-world money system. We have to have all that stuff in place before the rapture can occur. That's a confusion of categories when you do that. You're mixing two things that ought not to be mixed. You say to yourself, the tribulation period is rapidly approaching. And just as Thanksgiving precedes Christmas, the rapture precedes the tribulation period. And the rapture is coming even faster. And if that's true, maybe that will influence some of my choices as a Christian. Maybe I shouldn't, uh, you know, so quickly and easily go back to my sin nature, particularly when I'm on the freeway in rush hour. Maybe I shouldn't, you know, react the way that my flesh wants to react because, you know, any second I could stand before the Lord at the Bama Seat Judgment of Christ. And it would be sort of embarrassing for Jesus to come back and find me having a tantrum in my car, you know, you know as if getting mad in the car and yelling at people under your breath and all of that stuff is going to really help the traffic situation anyway. You know, maybe I should uh, seek under God's power to live a holy life. Because Jesus can come back at any minute. I see all the signs for the tribulation. And I know that the rapture will occur first. So, as best I know how to explain it, that is the best way to understand these ideas. Which... um, it takes us to question number three. Does Jesus literally fulfill the Jewish feasts or the feast days? If so, which fall feast day does Ezekiel 39 fulfill when all of Israel comes to faith in Jesus Christ? So on the Jewish calendar... There are seven feasts. The first four are what we call spring feasts, happening in the spring, beginning of the new year. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and sort of making your way down through the circle there going clockwise, then Pentecost. And once you hit Pentecost, you have the end of the spring feasts. And then there's a long gap a long interim. And once you get through that long interim, then you're going to have the three fall feasts. Those are trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Those are the seven feasts of Israel. Now, if that weren't enough, there were certain high events that happened in the Bible where the Jews got another feast day out of it. One of them is called Purim, lots celebrating the miraculous deliverance of the nation of Israel from the diabolical plans of Haman in the book of Esther. 
And when that happened, a brand new feast came out of it called Purim. And then between the Testaments, there was a very significant event that took place where the Jewish nation liberated their temple from Seleucid rule and rededicated it. That's called Hanukkah. And so Hanukkah, Feast of Lights, dedication, was added to the Jewish calendar. So seven feasts initially, as biblical history began to elapse more, nine feasts in totality. And God outlined those seven feasts for Israel. This has nothing to do with the church. Because when God gave these feasts, he was giving them specifically to the nation. The church didn't even exist yet. He outlined these feasts at Mount Sinai in the Mosaic Law. And you'll find a description of them in Leviticus chapter 23. The fall or the first four spring feasts are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Then a long interim in the calendar. And then you'll have the three fall feasts, trumpets, atonement, and booths. Now what you have to understand about those seven feasts is they all point to Jesus. The first four spring feasts point to his first coming. The remaining three fall feasts point to his second coming. And the long interim in between the end of the spring and the beginning of the fall is the church age that we're in right now, the inner Advent age. So on Passover, Jesus disclosed himself as the Passover lamb. It's a feast that is speaking of his redemption that he would accomplish for humanity, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Passover points to the redemption of Christ. Then there was another feast that took place right after Passover on the Jewish calendar called Unleavened Bread, where the nation of Israel, when they were released from Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, was told, you've been here for 430 years, but you've got to get out right now. And you've got to get out so fast that you shouldn't have leavened bread because it takes time for bread to rise. And so unleavened bread became a symbol within the nation of Israel, of Israel leaving Egypt. It's kind of a type, if you will, of the believer's sanctification. And Jesus claimed to be a fulfillment of that feast in John chapter 6, verse 35, where he called himself the bread of life. The next spring feast is first fruits. That has to do with the celebration of the initial crop that comes in. And it was a happy time in the Israeli harvest cycle because if the first crop came in, then it guaranteed the rest of the crop. And that speaks of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, and verse 23 of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He specifically calls, Paul does, Christ's resurrection first fruits. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then who else is going to rise from the dead? Everyone else. Just like the first fruits of the harvest guaranteed the rest of the harvest, the bodily resurrection of Jesus guarantees the fact that we too, in God's time, will be resurrected. Then there is a long, oh, we forgot Pentecost, didn't we? The fourth spring feast. That's the full harvest celebration. And that's the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish remnant. And that's the beginning, actually, of the church age. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. But that pouring out of the Holy Spirit actually was given to rebuke unbelieving Israel because unbelieving Israel at that particular point in time was attributing the work of God like tongues, 
for example, to drunkenness. And no, it wasn't drunkenness. It was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So you have Passover fulfilled in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, as the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. You can also toss in there John 1, verse 29, the Feast of Unleavened Bread pointed to Jesus as the bread of life, John 6, verse 35. First fruits points to his resurrection, and Pentecost points to the giving of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Then there's a long gap, just like the calendar. It's a long time between the end of the last spring feast and the beginning of the first fall feast. Now, what is happening during that long gap of time? That's us. That's the church age, a mystery where God today is not building his kingdom. He's building his body, the body of Christ, which is going to be, as we saw earlier, supernaturally removed from the world through the rapture at a specific point in time. And then subsequent to the rapture, God is going to put his hand right back on Israel. And just as he fulfilled for Israel the first four fall feasts, he's going to fulfill for Israel the remaining three spring feasts. I think I had that backwards, didn't I? Let me say that again. Just as he fulfilled for Israel the first four spring feasts, I get that right? He's going to put his hand back on Israel and fulfill for Israel the remaining three fall feasts. So on the Feast of Trumpets, what will be fulfilled is Matthew 24, verse 31, where Jesus will blow a trumpet. The angel actually will blow a trumpet. In fact, to be honest with you, I can't remember if Jesus blows that trumpet or... Angel builds that trumpet. So when worse comes to worse, you actually have to open your Bible and read it. Amen? He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. There we go. And they will gather together his elect. Who are the elect? Israel. From the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So on trumpets, all of the Jews who are persecuted by the Antichrist will be regathered in preparation for the kingdom. This is not a vertical gathering, as is the case with the rapture. This is a horizontal gathering. And on atonement, he will fulfill Zechariah 12, verse 10, which is the conversion of the nation of Israel. And then in the Feast of Booths, Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 18, that will be fulfilled during the millennial kingdom. So the question is, concerning Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, are Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 going to take place on a feast day? No, if you're talking about chapter 38. Yes, if you are talking about chapter 39. Because Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 22, and verse 29 speaks of the conversion of Israel. And we can see from our chart here that the conversion of Israel is what is typified in atonement. So Charles Feinberg says of Ezekiel 39, not 38, 39. Verses 25 through 29 teach the complete return of Israel, and that will occur after the defeat of Gog and his confederates. Ezekiel summarized his prophecies of hope and restoration. What he stated, and this is in the very last verse of the chapter, Ezekiel 39. When he stated, God will have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, he had in mind that all previous restorations were partial, now a universal and final restoration will take place. It was God who allowed them to go into captivity. It is he who will see to it that they are regathered indeed. It is he who will ensure that no one is left out of the land. In conclusion, to summarize 
all the benefits promised, Ezekiel spoke of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on, or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the house of Israel. So Zechariah 12 verse 10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. What is that? That's Day of Atonement stuff, according to the chart. So trumpets, and I'm not really sure, I've been in dialogue with some Jewish believers, like, for example, my friend Olivier Melnick. I said, are these going to be happening on a specific day, or are these sort of generically pointing to the second advent of Christ? He's more of the opinion that they sort of generically point towards the second advent of Christ and don't have to be fulfilled on a specific day. Others say, no, it has to happen on that same day. So how that happens, we'll just have to see. But I do know this much, that trumpets points to the regathering of the Jewish people at the end of the tribulation period. Atonement points to the conversion of the nation of Israel. Booths, in general, points to the millennial kingdom. So just as the first four spring feasts point to the first advent of Christ, the remaining three fall feasts point to the second advent of Christ, and the long interim in between, which is us, the church, are not connected to any feast day at all. Paul was very clear that we should not go under the Jewish law. Um, he was very clear that we should not get wrapped up in celebrating particular Jewish feasts if we think that that's going to somehow contribute to our salvation, justification, or progressive sanctification. Now, I'm in favor of kind of doing Bible studies so that we appreciate these Jewish feasts but here at Sugarland Bible Church, we do not demand people go under this in a compulsory sense for growth in Christ. But we do think there's value in studying these feasts because when you study them out very carefully, they point to either the first coming of Christ, the four spring feasts, and the second advent of Christ, the remaining three fall feasts, and if you're going to put Ezekiel 39 into any of these feasts, because the end game of Ezekiel 39 is the conversion of Israel, I would put Ezekiel 39 into atonement, because that speaks to the future con conversion of the nation of Israel. So I hope that helps um, at least a little bit. All right, here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. We're about to enter turbulence. Um, a lot of the questions that I received on Ezekiel 38 and 39 deals with a collection of prophecies that I call, or not I, but this is the name people give to them, they're called either the first prophecies, the now prophecies, or the next prophecies. In other words, a number of teachers out there are going to God's word beyond Ezekiel 38 and 39. And they're going to prophecies that, quite frankly, as you study them, and I'll, I'll show you proof of this as we go, these prophecies have been fulfilled for a long time. But what they're doing now, and it's sort of a new movement, I guess this started maybe 10, 15 years ago, is they're going to these prophecies, and they're basically trying to argue that there's something that's going to happen first before the tribulation starts. There's something that's going to happen first before the Gog-Magog war. Now, they're generally careful enough not to say these have to happen before the rapture. 
Because if they do that, they are denying eminency. But what is happening today is you go to prophecy conferences and people aren't really interested as much in Ezekiel 38 and 39 anymore, which is where I think the main action is today. I mean, God today is, of all the prophecies in the Bible, he's setting the stage aggressively for Ezekiel 38 and 39. But you go to these, some of their conferences and you read some of their books and they say, ah, that's old stuff. You need to be aware of the first prophecies, the next prophecies, the now prophecies. So these are prophecies that are supposed to happen like, you know, next week as they talk. And here are the areas that they go to. Let me show you where I'm drawing my material from because I don't know of a book that does a better job analyzing these than this book. It's uh, by my friend Mark Hitchcock. It's a 2020 book. It's called Showdown with Iran. And it's a wonderful book on Iran and where Iran fits into Bible prophecy, Ezekiel 38 and 39. But you get to the end of the book and he has two appendices, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2, where he's giving a response And he does a good a job on this as I know of anybody doing it, a response to the now or the next or the first prophecies. So I'm drawing my material to analyze these now or next uh, or first prophecies from Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 of Mark Hitchcock's book, showdown with Iran. So if you want to drill down further on this, that's the source I would send you to. Because these now or next or first prophecies are areas of the Bible where it's very clear there's already been a prophetic fulfillment, but people are ripping them out of context to try to sort of put together a prophetic scenario that will somehow precede the tribulation period. And as we get into this, I want you to keep in mind what Charles Ryrie said. He said something very, very important. He said this actually in a foreword to Arnold Fruchtenbaum's book, The Footsteps of the Messiah. I want to read these sentences to you because I want this to sink in. Because this is the struggle that you face every time you get into this subject that we're dealing with here, Bible prophecy, the end times. Charles Ryrie says, eschatology, that's the study of the end according to the Bible. Eschatology seems to suffer at the hands of both its friends and its foes. Those who play it down usually avoid assigning specific meaning to prophetic texts. Those who play it up often assign too much. Close quote. And what he is talking about here is balance. When you get into this subject, just like any subject you get into in life, whether it's in the Bible or outside the Bible, you have to stay balanced. And there are tremendous, tremendous, tremendous imbalances in the study of Bible prophecy. The first imbalance is what Ryrie says, people who usually play it down to avoid specific meanings to prophecies. Now, most of the time in this series and other series I've done at this church on prophecy, I'm reacting against that first group. These would be Reformed theologians, replacement theologians, amillennialists, postmillennialists. These are people that will look at these prophecies like Ezekiel 38 and 39, Revelation 20, the rapture, you name it, and say they're non-literal, they're allegorical. And so you'll notice in our teachings that we've done on prophecy here, I've spent 99% of my time reacting against that group. So you probably already know something against that group or about them. 
But there's another group, Ryrie says, that you have to react against. And that's people that don't read too little into prophecy, but they read too much into prophecy. And they get into concepts that really are nothing more than wild speculation. The Antichrist is, you know, living next door, and um, they, they, some will assign a specific date for the rapture of the church. And, um, you know, uh, just, I mean, absolutely crazy stuff. And so, in one sense, it's nice to run into people that take Bible prophecy seriously. But according to Ryrie's quote, those people are just as damaging as the first group. The first group reads too little into the prophecies. The second group reads too much into the prophecies. And I'm convinced that this is what's happening with these next, now, or first prophecies. So what are the next, now, or first prophecies that are being wrenched out of context to promote scenarios that aren't clearly taught in the Bible. These are the prophecies related to Elam, which is Persia or Iran. And there's two places that they go, Jeremiah 49 and Ezekiel 32. The second area where I think these folks are reading too much into prophecy are the prophecies concerning Damascus. There's two areas that they go, Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49. In fact, I was at a conference, several thousand people were at this conference in Canada, and one gentleman whose name, if I called his name, you would all know him, he got up and he said, Damascus is going to be hit by Israel because of the presence of Iran and Russia and Turkey in Damascus, Syria. And that will be the fuse which will ignite the Gog-Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And he said it with such confidence, you would think such an idea is found in the Bible. And what you'll discover is they're basing this initial attack by Israel into Syria before the Gog and Magog war happens. They're basing the whole thing on Isaiah 17, verses 1 and 2. And yet when you study Isaiah 17, verses 1 and 2 in context, and I'll show you the context, that prophecy was fulfilled in 732 B.C., And so it becomes a very dangerous thing to build a scenario allegedly coming from the Bible that excites a lot of people and sells a lot of books and captures a lot of interest. You know, the the hit on Damascus is going to be the fuse which ignites Gog and Magog. It's one thing to get up in front of people and say that with confidence. It's another thing to actually prove that that's what the Bible says. And I'll show you that it does not teach that. So the prophecies concerning Elam or Iran, two places to find them, Jeremiah 49, Ezekiel 32. Two prophecies concerning Damascus, Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49. And the third area is the Psalm 83 war, supposedly. Psalm 83 is being taught like it's some kind of future war. There's one problem with that. You read Psalm 83 and there's no war described. Other than that, no real problem, right? So in, in, in an attempt to be relevant, in an attempt to be sensational, what's happening in the area of prophecy is people are becoming overly speculative. They're teaching things with dogmatism that the Bible doesn't teach. And so that's why I so appreciate what Ryrie says, is either camp will damage you. The people that allegorize prophecy, they're damaging, and equally damaging are the people that are promoting these first, now, or next prophecies. 
So in our next class together, we'll be getting into those uh, prophecies. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word. Help us to be balanced on a very important subject in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Happy intermission.